hallelujah, salvation and glory, honor and power. Let me see you make it easy. He's wonderful in your life. Yes. Hallelujah. Come on, sing all of us. Who taught God to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel? 
three things to sacrifice in life and to commit fornication. <laughs> Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Seventeen altogether. And he answered, and he let hear the Spirit said to me, Pray. And he let Sin on the throne of high, 
For God is a God who sees everything, who knows everything, who is everywhere, and always keeps his eye, has his eye on his children. So we have come this morning to praise. We have come this morning to give you thanks amid the problems that we face in our lives, amid the troubles of our homes, amid the troubles of our jobs, amid the ups and downs of this world. Lord, we have come to say thank you for giving us all that we need, that we needed to teach us through. Praise your name, Lord. We are here on our knees, lifting our hearts. Say no thank you, Jesus. If we don't believe that there is a God, I tell you these last days we better show you now. For what we are seeing that is happening, Lord, what we see that things are happening that your word says will happen. Help us to keep our eyes on the prize. Lord, the Lord, these things will be two or more with you. To avoid such a time like this. You have called us to look up. To keep our eyes. Focus on you for redemption during time. There are those who, for whatever reason, Lord, they have decided and chose to write and to place their petitions in a special prayer box that have been set aside for praying. And we say thank you that you know every prayer that is written, every after prayer, every problem. I'm grateful that you came through the line all the way down in these last days where you died on the cross and you faced everything and even more that we face today. So you understand our pride, you understand our pain, you understand our frustration, you understand, you understand everything. So whatever is written, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit goes upon the hearts of those who are written for the that they, that they will see the hand of God in their life, in their family's life, in their children's life, in their husband's life, in their wife's life, in their community. Help them, help them not to be discouraged, but to keep on finding time, spending time, not only to study your word, which is quite important, but also to witness in the community, to witness wherever we go, so we can be encouraged as we do so. Bless this church, bless our pastor, as he speaks and stands up to speak of the herald the everlasting gospel this morning. And we pray, O oh Father, as we listen, that those who have come to visit us today, we pray that the word of God may deep into their heart, that they will surrender and will give our return to you. Bless the babies and arms of the young of the youth today, for you have promised that you will contend with them, that contend with your children and save them. Thank you, Lord, that even though they may be doing sometimes things on their own, you are covering them and that you are keeping them, but also for them to recognize that these are the last days that they need to turn their strength and their, all of their energies into serving you. Bless those who are on the sick and shall bless as they look unto you, Lord, ever to be reminded that in Christ that you are coming soon. I have to keep first and foremost in their mind their commitment to you, to love and to serve you until the end. Thank you for hearing our prayer. Thank you for blessing us this morning. And we worship you, accept our worship. And we thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. 
brought them up in January to make yourself right, bring yourself current with your past times and all that. And uh, as a result of our church in the hospital, people will come forward and bring us up this time. Yes, that you would uh, 
and place the reason down in his tent to give you the gift to give you all the praises that you got in the church of Syria.
Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. How are you today? Uh oh. Some people are dressed and some aren't. Uh oh. Let's start that again. Happy Sabbath, boys and girls. How are you doing today? That's right. I heard that. Bless. Well, I have something in my head that's very important when I'm traveling. What is this? A GPS system. Why is a GPS system good? You tell me. Because it takes me somewhere? You mean like somewhere when I don't know where I'm going? Yeah. What about you? What do you think? It tells me where I need to go. If you forget where you go, what about if you get lost? So you said it takes you where you're going to go, you could forget where you're going, and then you get lost, right? Well, you know what? A long time ago, I would say about 2,000 years ago, there was a GPS given to us about life. And you know what? If you get lost, if you don't know where to go, if you don't know how to get where you're going, just like this is a good idea to have in your car, for life, this is a good idea to have. What is this? Why is the Bible important? It tells you how to get to where. It tells you where. Almost done. Who wants to help a brother? It tells you what? It tells you how to get to heaven. So, could you get lost on your way to heaven? Kind of, yes. I've lived a long time to let you know that you can get kind of lost. But you got to go back to God's GPS. Yeah. Okay. Mom, is it that easy to this guy's GPS? Yeah. Give it to us a long time ago before this came out, right? Yeah. Mom, is it that easy to warn you to know to That's how it's going to be story. Because it's more important than this, getting where you want to go in case you get lost and don't know where you're going, or you lose your way. This will help you make money in your life. Very important. Short story there, but so important for all of us. This GPS or this PG GPS? Which is the best one? This one. This tells you where to go on earth, but this tells me how to get to. Hey, Amen. I think you got that. Pray with me. Nice hands. Dear Jesus, thank you for the old school GPS. It teaches us how to get on our way to heaven. Help us to read it, learn about it, listen to the stories about it, and pay attention to the directions. Help us, God. Thank you very much, boys and girls. All oh, God's children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be their peace. All oh, God's children shall be taught of the Lord, Isaiah 51, 13. All oh, God's children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be their peace. All oh, God's children shall be taught of the Lord, Morning, Christian friends.
lessons of development of shear here in this kind of state, securing all of these things by live streaming, this is just for the sake of question. Thank you for zoning in on the chess uh, diagram, so it's just appreciate that. Let us follow by the heads at this time. Our message that I want to share with you is entitled, What's the Name? What's the Name? Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for family. We want to thank you, Lord, for fellowship. Father, we want to thank you for this great communion that we have with the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for the atoning blood of our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we just want to thank you for being the loving Father that you are. Lord, continue to help us to understand the words of our Savior so that we can be better in our condition and truly begin to reflect the values that Jesus left for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to read to you a very fascinating, very mysterious passage of Scripture. It's one that we already read, but I want to come back to it again. And this uh, is the message of the churches in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, beginning with verse 7. And Verse 17, this is actually part of a message to the church of Pergamos. And the word of God says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden matter, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. You know, this is a wonderful passage of scripture. The scene here is a sea of glass. And there you stand with your colors, talking about the real you, no longer having to wear a mask. And in the transcendent glory of this scene, you can't even remember anything bad that happened in your previous life. And then he steps forward, and mirroring in his eyes, you see all the love of the universe. And in those nail scarred hands, there's going to be a white stone, and there's going to be a new name written on it. Yeah. Now, may it may not be a literal stone, because we know lots of the book of Revelation is written in symbolic language, but it's going to be a new name. A new name. It's going to be a name <clears throat> that is going to <clears throat> represent the real you or the real self. You see, ever since our, ever since man sinned, God has been trying to restore in us the authentic self. Ever since our parents put on those fig leaves, we've all been wearing masks. We've all been hiding. But God wants to restore you. And I'm happy to tell you here uh, this afternoon that God is restoring you. He's restoring you through the process that we call sanctification. And someday there's going to be a white stone. There's going to be a name written on that stone. And it's going to represent you. But remember, the message is entitled, What's in a Name? And most of us, we highly value our names. Some people are given a name after famous ancestors. Or you may be given a name for a renowned person by your parents when you were born, and so because of that, you highly value your name. Many of us go to the dictionary and see the meaning of our name, and sometimes we're presently surprised that what the dictionary says about you actually represents uh, a strong character trait that you have. I have four children, uh, Kenneth Jr., Alethea, Deshaun, and Andrea. What does Kenneth mean? Kenneth is a Celtic name, and it simply means handsome. Oh. <laughs> what does Alethea mean? You know, when I was studying Greek at Andrews, uh, not at Andrews, but at Oakland University, uh, I had a toss up between two things. <laughs> You know, one of them sounded better than the other one. I love Harmatia. Uh, but Harmatia means sin, so I, I, I didn't want to name my daughter Harmatia. 
you know, but the, uh, the other option was Aletheia, and Aletheia means truth in Greek. So I named her Truth. As a matter of fact, if anyone is named Althea, Althea is coming from the same Greek root. The Sean is a name, it's a biblical name, and it comes from the Old Testament, it seems to lend itself toward leadership. Andrea is a Latin name, and it simply means woman. Woman. An elderly woman who had a rather miserable life, she blames it on her name as the fifth child in the family. She was given a name that meant fertility, and she says that that was the story of her life. But you know, in Europe, up until about the 11th century, uh, most Europeans had only one name. But as they began to grow and the population began to increase, they had to begin to uh, distinguish from each other, and then they began to give surnames. And the surnames came from four primary sources. A man's occupation, or maybe I should say a person's occupation, uh, a person's location, uh, a, uh, it, it could be uh, uh, patrimonial, or it could be from characteristics. For instance, occupation, for instance, uh, cook. You might find uh, John Cook, or if the person works in a mill, it might be John Miller or Dr. Miller. Uh, location, uh, overheal. You would have like John Overheal or John Broke. If it was patrimonial, it would be like John's son or Johnson or Nickel son or Anger son or Nelson. Uh, if it dealt with characteristics of particular person or family, it might be small. John Small, or John Short, or John Longfellow, or Vernon Longman. <laughs> you know, our ancestors, the ancient ancestors of the African, uh, you know, they believe that a child's name uh, related to both his behavior and his personality. Many African parents. They would wait a few days or maybe a few weeks before they named their child. The reason why is because they felt that life was viewed as an organic whole. In other words, they felt that the life was composed of the community of the living, the dead, and the unborn. And if there was a good spirit among one of the long uh, 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 deceased loved ones, uh, then they would wait a while and observe to see what dominant personality would show up in a child. And in order to keep that positive uh, character trait running in the family, then they would name the child after that particular person. Of course, we know that no society, after society included, is able to keep evil for popping up. But the beautiful thing about the African ancestors by naming in this ritual they recognize that to invent any name for a child may invite a host of uh, unwanted spirits in the child's character. For example, very few parents would name their child Satan or Lucifer. And, and, and probably we could count the number of people on our hand that actually named their child Jezebel. In a very subtle way, we find that Malcolm X, you know, he was uh, uh, making mention of the fact that one of the reasons that he felt that there was some divisiveness, you know, amongst uh, and backbiting, maybe because of, of some of the names that we have. So we know Malcolm X can change his name. After the slave experience, most of the slaves were going to maintain or even maintain sanity. They wanted uh, three or four definite changes when they came out of slavery. First of all, they were determined in many cases to change their name. Second, they wanted to learn the Bible and learn how to read, particularly the Bible. And they also wanted to have decent Rome and decent clothes. They also wanted to be married in the right way. Uh, before a preacher. And uh, in addition,
addition, you know, that uh, uh, there were many things that went on in that particular culture. In reaction to our history and the deadly effect upon the conscience of many black people, there were a number of well-known blacks that resulted also to adopting uh, Arabic or African names uh, to replace uh, the, the Western name. For instance, you have Buell Sender, you know, they on became uh, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, as his play, as we know, he changed his name to Muhammad Ali. And then you have a very known uh, poet that just recently died, Leroy Jones uh, Amari. Well, Leroy Jones, he changed his name to Amari Baraka. And then you have John L. Lee, who changed his name to uh, Haki uh, Modabuti. And he was another very, very well known poet you know, uh, of our time. But you know, with all of the billions of people on the face of this earth, you have to stop and wonder, how come we have so many common names? You know, names like Bob and Jim and Jack and Bill and Jane. You know, there's approximately seven and a half billion people on the face of this earth, and no two people are exactly alike. There are no two fingerprints that's exactly alike. Matter of fact, if somebody came along and they tried to forge your fingerprints, an expert can always look at it and tell whether or not it was forged. And one of these days, standing on the sea of glass, those nail scarred hands is going to clasp your ear and put a and they'll whisper a new name. But the question is, what will that new name that God is going to give us? What is this going to mean? I want you to think some deep thoughts with me today about names. There are four things I would like to say about names. First of all, names are very important to God. And I think that that's one of the reasons why God inspired the Apostle Paul to conclude the book of Romans the way he did. Now, when you look in the 16th chapter of Romans, you would think that Paul would have ended that book with big names or words like justification or sanctification, or maybe something about the magnificent universal love of God, or maybe using big words like omnipotent and omniscient and omnipresent and transcendent you would think that God would have inspired the Apostle Paul to work that book up to a peak of exaltation. But what do you find when you get to the end of the book of Romans, in the 16th chapter? You find names. You find names like Timothy and Rufus and Lucius. These were the common people of 2,000 years ago. Names like Jason and Priscilla. And Aquila, Andronicus, Mary. But listen at some of you know the very first verse of chapter 16. It talks about a woman by the name of Phoebe. Now that's a perfectly good name. She was a dear Christian woman who was a hired worker for the Lord. And Paul says she's coming to visit. So I want you to I want you to assist her in whatever business that she has for you. Then we find in the beginning of verse three, where it says, "And greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ." We also made mention of uh, the mother of Rufus in the thirteenth verse, and he calls Rufus's mother his own mother. In other words, we're talking about a spiritual relationship here. He didn't even forget about the kitchen help. He says, remember the Christian slaves in Narcissus' house in verse 11. And altogether, we find 35 names in the 27 verses of the last chapter of the book of Romans. And that's how Paul ended that book. But these were the Little people will cause that. And I think that God inspired Paul to record these names because names are indeed important with God. And that little boy grew up in Bethlehem in his ministry. Matter of fact, God spoke to Joseph and says, You must call his name, what everybody? Jesus. 
We find in John chapter 3 and verse 16 where the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now I want you to know, I like the fact that God loved the world so much that he was willing to give his son to die for this world. But even more than that, I am thrilled about the idea that God loved Kenneth Green so much that he was willing to die if it was just for me. In Jeremiah, he said, I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. In other words, before he was born, God had already appointed that Jeremiah would be his spokesman before he was even born. To Abraham, God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son at about this time next year. To Rebecca, God says, two nations are in thy womb. In other words, two manner of people. One shall be the stronger and the elder shall serve the weaker. You see, brothers and sisters, the point that God is trying to make here is that before the cradle, God knew you. And when you die, God has prepared a memory capsule about you that's going to represent you in your totality, about everything, about you. Every last one of you sitting here this morning, God knows you. Knows us as we are. And he knows us as we will one day become. And name, the name that God is going to prepare for you is going to represent you as you walk together in the fields with God and your hearts are going to ring with laughter when you commune with God, when we commune with God in that heavenly kingdom because names are important with God. Now the second deep thought I want you to consider with me is this. Names are indicative of Character. The person is the name, and the name is the person. In the biblical record, very often, when a person's character changed, their name also changed. For instance, Jacob. Jacob meant crook. It meant deceiver. It meant supplanter. It meant trickster. He cheated his brother out of his birthright, Esau, and he deceived his blind, dying daddy. But later on, when Jacob got his act together, his name was changed to Israel, which means that he was an overcomer, that he prevailed. You know, when you look at the name of Sarah, Sarai was Abraham's wife before her name changed. Sarai means contentious. It means rebellious. But finally, when Sarai got her act together, her name was changed to Sarah, which means princess. Likewise, we find aspects of God's character portrayed in his name. The name Yahweh means I am that which I am. And this is in connection to God bringing his people out of captivity. In other words, God says, I've established my covenant by giving you the land of Canaan. I am Yahweh. I am the one that brought you out from under the Egyptians, and you will know me as Yahweh, your God. Therefore, this name Yahweh stands for never changing purpose. It stands for integrity. And the name is important, brothers and sisters, because in these last days, when scoffers come and they say, where is the promise of his coming? To know God is to know the reality of his promise. Come on and say amen. His promises are sure because his name is sure. But the question is, what about your name? What does your name stand for? I got a sister by the name of Ramon. Ramon is a Spanish name, and it means mighty, it means wise, it means protector. The name Owen is Old Welsh. It means well-born one. It means young warrior, a man of good breeding, a man of good manners. That's what Owen means. Elizabeth, consecrated to God. I have a sister by the name of Wendy. Wendy means wanderer. A dream-led daughter roaming Philadelphia, seeking violence in the snow. That is the meaning of Wendy. 
You know, some years ago, there used to be a man by the name of Rodemar. And this man, Rodemar, was always bragging, always boasting. Whenever people heard that kind of talk, they would just throw up their hands and say, that's just Rodemar. Well, today, if you were to go to the dictionary, you would find a word, rodomante, which means bragging or talking big. Have you ever had somebody to call you a maverick? Samuel Maverick was a Texas cattle ranger that refused to brand his cattle. And so in the cattle raising regions, when an animal was found without the owner's brand, in other words, uh, 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 a calf that may have strayed away from his mother, uh, you know, they realized that, you know, that particular calf must belong to Maverick. And so they began to name those animals Mavericks. Today we apply that to individuals who depart from certain customs or beliefs of the group. What about the name Benedict? Benedict was a uh, uh, was a general during the American Revolutionary War. Uh, lived in Norwich, Connecticut. He deserted the army here and he joined up with the British forces. And so today to be called Benedict would be a name that would be equivalent to being a traitor. Now, brothers and sisters, your name may never make it into the dictionary, but in the minds of certain people, your name is picking up certain characteristics. People in the job, people in the neighborhood, people in the church, when they hear the name happiness, when they hear the word happiness, do they think about you? Or how about integrity? How about kindness? How about gossip? How about Big mom. How about complainer? How about joker? How about conceit? How about stuck up? How about lazy? How about liar? Now, why is this important? It is important because every last one of us here, we have taken on the name of Christ. And as Christians, your characteristics become linked with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Have you brought a reproach to that name? Names are indicative of character. Now the third thought I want you to think about with names is names help us to realize who we are. Some of us don't know who we are as an individual. We don't know who we are as a people, and we put on a mask, and we try to escape reality and responsibility of being the real you. But again, acceptance of an image that we think that would be better received than what we really are, we'll put on a fake personality. Uh, some of us, when we go visiting family, we or visiting period, we don't want people to know that we are Seventh-day Adventist Christians. I want you to know that I am very proud of that name, Seventh-day Adventist. I'm always willing and ready to give a reason for the existence of that name. There are two great doctrines that are significant in the name Seventh-day Adventist. First of all, you have the Sabbath, and then you have the second advent of Jesus Christ. Now, we might have been called many other things rather than seven the advent. We might have been called Methodists because John Wesley, the founder of the Methodist faith, got together with some of, their, some of his friends and they began to study the Bible. And as a Methodist, John Wesley and his friends, they would read the Bible every day. They would observe the morning watch. They would pray every day. And so they were given the nickname of Methodists. We might have taken that name Methodist because as a Methodist, we have something similar here. We believe that people should keep the morning watch, don't we? We believe that we should study our Sabbath school lesson every day, don't we? We believe that you should pray every day. We also believe in the great pillar of the Methodist doctrine, holiness of life. We might have called ourselves Methodists, but that would not have been fair because there are certain things 
uh, that, that is characteristic of the Methodist faith that we don't quite fall in tune with. We might have called ourselves Presbyterian because Presbyterianism relates to the doctrine of the Presbyter and the members of the Presbyterian church believe in the rule of the church by the elders. We have a form of Presbyterian governance because we also believe that the elders in the church should play a leading part in leading out spiritually. We might have taken that name as Presbyterian, but as far as uh, the organization and what we stand for, there is a difference. It wouldn't have been fair if we took on that name. We might have called ourselves congregationalists. Because though we recognize the Presbyterian principle, we also believe that the congregation has a part in the governance of the church. That's why even when we have the nomination of officers, before you can be complete, there had to be a unanimous decision on the part of this congregation. Congregation with the vote has equal part with the Presbyterian. So we might have taken on the name of Congregationalist, but that would not have been fair. We might have called ourselves Baptists because we believe in baptism as a practice, Bible baptism by immersion. We might have taken on the name of Baptist, but that would not have been fair to us, and it would not have been fair to them because there are some distinct things that are different between us and the Baptists. We might have called ourselves Catholics because Catholic means universal. And ours is a Catholic movement because it is the aim of the Seventh-day Adventist Church to carry this message to all the world in this generation. Come on and say amen. But then people would confuse us with the Holy Roman Apostolic Catholic Church and that would not have been fair. So we, have, we could have taken on many different names but we chose the name Seventh-day Adventist. And this particular name holds up before the world two great reforms, the coming of Christ and the Seventh-day Sabbath. And these two great reforms is brought to the attention of the Christian and non-Christian world every time the name Seventh-day Adventist is mentioned. I am therefore Seventh-day Adventist number one because I believe that Jesus' is coming is very, very near. Not that it will come someday, somehow, somewhere, but that his coming is very imminent, that his coming is very near. I believe people living today, if they don't have enough time, they death, you're going to see Jesus coming in the clouds of glory. All of the prophecies in the word of God is telling us that the coming of Jesus Christ is very, very near and is even at the door. Daniel chapter 2, where it talks about that huge, huge metal wind and that clay image that Nebuchadnezzar had a dream about, depicting the consecutive kingdoms of the world. I'm talking about Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, and Rome. And then you have the divided kingdoms of the fall of the Roman Empire, making up the nations of Western Europe today. The Bible says in that chapter, in the days of these kings, in the days of France and Germany and Spain and Portugal, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom that shall never come to an end. Come on and say amen. That's one of the reasons why I believe that the coming of Jesus Christ is very, very near. It's not far away. Then we find in the 8th chapter of Daniel where it deals with the subject of the heavenly sanctuary. I'm talking about the 2300 year prediction that reaches all the way to the middle of the 19th century from 1844 and onward. The judgment hour message is connected with that prediction where it talks about Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Come out of her, my people. The three angels' message, the mark of the beast. We are the recipients of these messages. This is another reason why I believe that Jesus Christ is coming very soon. Then when we study in the 24th chapter of Matthew, it gives us signs in the physical universe. It talks about earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars and famines and 
pestilence. All of these signs are happening in our day, folks. Jesus is coming soon. We are living in the time of the end or the time just prior to the coming of Jesus. That's why I'm an advocate. We are waiting the second advent of Jesus Christ. Somebody probably said, well, why are you a Seventh-day Adventist? Well, the first and most important reason that I can give you why I am a Seventh-day Adventist is because God commanded it. Come on and say amen. God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou live and do all thy work, but the seventh day the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, nor thou and thy son of thy daughter, nor thy man servant of but in thy strength, but in the strength with, within thy house. Well, you, know, you know the rest of that, that particular uh, uh, commandment that God has given us. And unfortunately, though the majority of the Christian world, brothers and sisters, even though God said, remember the Sabbath day, remember the seventh day, the majority of the world today has forgotten it. Revelation 12, and verse 17 mentioned about a last day church. I'm talking about a last group of people that will be recognized by heaven as the special recipients of God's grace, for it says, and the dragon, meaning Satan, was wrought. He was angry with the woman that represents the church and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Remnant is the last part of God's church just prior to his second coming, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Come on and say amen. So here we have a picture of God's people awaiting the second coming of Jesus Christ. God says the devil is going to be angry with you. He's going to make war against God's church in the last days. It also says that there are two things that's characteristic of his church. His remnant church. They keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And Revelation 19.10 says that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. God's church understands and can break this prophetic word down. Come on and say amen. These are identifying marks of God's church in the last days. So this is a pretty good reason for being a Seventh-day Adventist. Another reason why I believe that we ought to be proud of this same Seventh-day Adventist is because our ancestors were Seventh-day Adventists. Adam was a Seventh-day Adventist. Enoch was a Seventh-day Adventist. Abraham was a Seventh-day Adventist. Joel was a Seventh-day Adventist. Moses was a Seventh-day Adventist. David was a Seventh-day Adventist. Paul was a Seventh-day Adventist. Yeah. Jesus yeah. was a Seventh-day Adventist. Yeah. No less we name of Jesus. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For heaven and earth shall pass away before one jot, one tittle of the law shall fade. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. In other words, the word of God is saying custom is something that Jesus did over and over and over again. Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Friends, even Jesus positively identified as a Seventh-day Adventist. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty good reason to be a part and a member of this church. Come on and say amen. I'm not ashamed of this church, and I'm not ashamed of myself. I'm proud of me as an individual. I don't have to put on masks to try to be something that I'm not. Some of us, we have a tendency to play the hypocrite for so long when we get ready to try to be our real self, we don't even know what our real self is all about anymore. We allow other people to define us. I've seen it happen over and over again. Many times we go to family reunions. We get with relatives. We drink liquor. We smoke cigarettes. We dance and we 
curse. We put on all of the short attire that we shouldn't put on. And you would think that you were members of Shiloh Baptist Church the way some of us dress. Come on and say amen. In other words, we do whatever we have to do in order to be accepted. Some of you young people just trying to identify. Some of our young people who have lost their sense of direction. They smash windows and they smoke pot. And some of the older ones play loud. I had to get on the case of an elderly in my church because his wife was constantly complaining that he was gambling away their money, betting on horses. Uh, many times we laugh at filthy jokes. We lose our identity because we allow other people to identify us. We defame our name. We defame our family name. We defame our church name. We defame the name of Jesus Christ. We bring a reproach upon this church because we allow other people to define us. You might not know it, but in the listings of who's who for America, not everybody that is listed in that book are actual people. In every who's who in America, they have what they call burglar alarm or false entries that trip up the publishers that would try to steal their compiled list of names. In other words, the editor of who's who actually invent people who do not exist. And these people that they invent, they go to college, they marry, they have children, they gain honors, and they go on and on and on. Who knows, one day you might pick up a copy of Who's Who in America, and you might find your name listed in the dummies list. <laughs> but what is the point I'm trying to make here? The point is this. There are dummy entries in real life. Come on and say amen. You got dummy entries on the church book. People that never show up until all the work is done. In other words, you can't get some people that come to church every Sabbath. You can't get them to witness. You can't get them to give a Bible study. You can't even get them to come and clean the church. Dummy entries. People that sit, sit, sit comfortably. Playing a masquerade. Getting all dressed up on Sabbath morning and playing church. Brothers and sisters, what I'm saying, let's for 2016 yeah. and onward, let's not be dummies. Yeah. Come on and say amen. Yeah. Make up your mind what you're going to do. Don't let other people define you. You need to ask yourself the question do I accept who I am? Have I accepted my limitations? Have I accepted my age? Have I accepted my sex? Have I accepted my status as being single? Have I accepted my financial situation? Have I accepted the way I look? Have I accepted the color of my skin? Have I accepted my health? Do I really like me? In short, have I accepted myself for who I am and who God made me to be? You know, a true story was told about a young man, that, a young boy that was listening to his parents who were grudging up old arguments, things that have happened in the past. And he heard his parents arguing about the fact that, you know, the, the untimely birth of this young man. In other words, the wife had forgotten to take the pill. And so he was unwanted. And when he realized that, Young man became so suicidal he was about to take his life. And he said to himself, if my own parents don't want me, who wants me? I'll ask you that question. Jesus wants you. Jesus can relate to that kind of experience. Jesus himself was an unwanted child. Jesus was an embarrassment to his parents. Jesus was unexpected and unexplainable. It took the intervention of an angel from heaven to convince Joseph to go ahead and marry uh, his wife. He refused to believe her pregnancy was something of a divine uh, inception. Even growing up as a little boy, the scriptures reveals to us that Jesus was unwanted and those who Jesus came to save 
They rolled him out of this world on a cross. And so I'm sure that Jesus has a special place in his heart for the unwanted child, for the unloved wife, for the rejected husband, for the lonely cripple. I'm talking about Jesus. Jesus. And identify with that kind of pain that we suffer with. And I thank God that Jesus came to planet Earth to help us to know what it means to be wanted and what it means to be loved. Love came down here to Bethlehem and walked in the flesh among us. Love with the name that is above every name. Come on and say amen. I'm talking about Jesus. Jesus came when we had no name. We were victims of child abuse by our father, the devil. He came to be our friend. He came to give us the legal right to call ourselves sons and daughters of God. He gave us a family name. And I thank God that Jesus gave us power to live up to that name. Now why should you accept yourself? Jesus accepts you. Why should you love yourself? Jesus loves you. I want to read to you a statement coming from the Desire of Ages, page 668. Listen to what the servant of the Lord says. She says, the Lord is disappointed when his people place a low estimate upon themselves. He desires his chosen heritage to value themselves according to the price that he has placed on them. And what an infinite price that was. God wanted them else he would not have sent his son on such an expensive errand to redeem them. And so it is the value then of Jesus' sacrifice that we find value in the sight of God. And it goes on to say, because of his righteousness, we are accounted precious. Come on and say that. For Christ's sake, we have been pardoned. And she goes on to say, he does not see in us the vileness of a sinner, but rather the likeness of his son in whom we believe. I say praise God. I say thank you, Jesus. God loves us. God loves us. God didn't love us. God doesn't love us because we are valued. We are valuable because God loves us. It's this understanding of our value in Christ Jesus that enables all of us to be able to accept ourselves. And only when you can truly accept yourself that you can truly serve others. Why was Jesus able to wash the feet of Peter and Peter wasn't? It was because Jesus knew himself. Jesus accepted himself. Jesus knew who he was and where he had come from. He knew that he had come from God and he knew that he was going back to God. Peter didn't know about the relationship with his heavenly father the way Jesus did. And that's why Jesus was able to wash feet and Peter couldn't. When you know who you are, brothers and sisters, then you are free to love. You can go on singing if you want to. Such a worm am I. And I'm here to tell you that I'm a child of God. Come on and say hallelujah. Child of the king. Praise his holy name. Once you know who you are, nobody can come along and try to find you. My name is Tony Kitty. Don't call me Tony. Come on. You know what I'm talking about. My father is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. I got a heritage that is beyond the stars. And the integrity of that name gives me the assurance of knowing that Jesus is coming back again. We have an appointment with Jesus on that sea of glass. Come on and say amen. amen. And the fourth and final thing and thought I want to share with you on names is that of the potential of that name. You know, throughout the various cemeteries across the United States, there are hundreds and thousands of soldiers who have given their lives for this country in which you'll find that some of those graves, they don't even have a name on them. But on Memorial Day, what they'll do is they'll take a little flag and they'll put it beside that, a recognition of that brave warrior. 
And although we may not know who that soldier was, God knows who he was. Come on and say amen. You know, I used to go to the cemetery. You know, years ago when I was living around Middle Hope, around Kingston, uh, Kingston, New York, around Poughkeepsie, there was a cemetery that wasn't too far from the home. And it made me sound a little bit morbid. I would get up early in the morning. You know, just to get my mind together so I could preach. And I would go into this mausoleum that they had. Because in the mausoleum, it was made of glass and it was nice and warm in there. And it was very, very quiet. And I would go in there and I would pray and I would work on my message the Sabbath. And it wasn't a dead sermon when I preached it, I'll tell you that right now. But sometimes I would get out and I would just walk among the tombstones. And just to read some of the names on the tombstones. Anybody ever done that? Just reading the names. You see names like Goldstein or Knox or Tilly or Baldridge or Manson Brown or, or Sanders. And then sometimes you see a, a little child that only lived to be about 14 years of age. And then you begin to wonder what would the world be like today if these soldiers who have died at an early age or this little child that only lived to be the age of seven, what would the world be like today? Was it that we lost a great doctor or maybe a scientist, somebody that may have come up with a cure for some of these diseases uh, that we're struggling with? What was the potential of that name? You know, when I started college, you know, it wasn't my intent to go into the ministry. My aim was in the field of electronics. I enjoyed studying about ohms and amps and resistors and negative and positive forces, but God had other plans for my life. God knew me before I was born. Before God breathed the breath of life in my uh, body, he decided before I even went to college that I was going to be his spokesman. But I have to face it at my age. I'll perhaps never be a John Wesley, uh, a Martin Luther King Jr., uh, a C.D. Brooks, or a, a C.D. Uh, Bradford. And I just hope that as a result of my ministry, that I may have touched somebody's life. And what about you? On your job, at school, at home, in your neighborhood, what kind of influence are you exerting? You know, so often, you know what we do? So often we form our little cliques. We form our little cliques, brothers and sisters. You know we do that, don't you? And we shut people out. We form our little opposing camps within the church of God. In other words, you can't talk to this person because you belong to this group over here. Uh, brothers and sisters, do you know what it means to take the name of Jesus Christ? It means that God's attributes become your attributes. We need to accept all that that name has come to stand for. That name should stand for love. It should stand for integrity. It should stand for sacrifice. It stands for patience. It stands for service. It stands for obedience. It stands for kindness. In fact, the letter to the church of Pergamos, Christ commanded one thing, thou holdest fast my name. Hold fast my name. Perhaps you may feel well, I'm just one person, therefore, it really don't make a big difference in this spiritual conflict that's been going on down through the ages. But let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Wars are not just planes and tanks and battleships and rocket launchers and mach guns and MX missiles and Star Wars. War is a foxhole. It's that little piece of earth, that dirt, that smoke in your eye, that weapon in your hand, that armor on your body, that sword of the spirit, the helmet of salvation, the shield of faith. Little know the impact that a well-fought battle will have in this universal war that we're all tied with. What about Job? 
What a job had decided that he wanted now. He didn't know that beings were discussing him and talking about his integrity before God. They had challenged God that, that if God dealt harshly with him, that he would curse God to his face. He didn't realize the creator of the universe was filled with beings and they were looking down and they were watching his witness. He didn't know that a record was being recorded of his performance that would thrill audiences in earth 3,000 years after his death. All he knew, all he could feel was the boils and the pain and the financial disaster. His friends were unsympathetic to him. His wife told him about to curse God and die. All he knew about was his personal tragedy of his family and how his sons and daughters were wiped out. He didn't hear what others heard. He didn't hear the cheers coming from millions of angels saying, you can do it, Joe. Hang in there, Joe. Joe, God is on your side. He didn't hear all that. He didn't know that millions of angels, galaxies, was holding their breath to see whether or not he was going to curse God. When those words came rolling off his mouth, those he say me, yet will I trust him. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that all the heavenly hope erupted in God, saying, Joe, you did it. Joe, you did it. Joe, you did it. You know, the name Job means persecuted. But for some reason, brothers and sisters, I believe that when all of this is over, God gives Job that white stone, that name, that name that is going to be inscribed on that stone, stone is going to be vindicated because he vindicated the character of God. My brothers and sisters, God wants his name to be vindicated by us. You see, you too are part of something big. You too, we need to know. You shed a tear. There are millions of beings in other planets that shed a tear with you. They're counting on you to do your part, live up to that name. Maybe just a small little thing, just a kind Words spoken, just giving a helping hand. Words wisely spoken. Maybe it's just a quiet no or a church office well filled. Maybe seem like something very small. Wars are not fought on big maps. Wars are fought in factories, on your own little personal beachhead. Record is being kept. Everything that you do down here, somewhere, victory is being inscribed on a stone by a white laser beam of holy light. There awaits us. Name that's going to be written. Name that's going to stand for victory over synthetic sound. Name that's going to witness eternally to the loveliness of the real you and the one that you serve. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters. I want to have my name. I want to have that name that Jesus is going to have for me in that day. I want my name to stand for victory. I want to be able to stand up and vindicate the character of God. I believe that this is what God is looking for in 2016. God wants people to take a stand, to give their life to him, to come members and, and, and warriors in his army. Maybe somebody here today, you want to unite with God's commandment keeping church. This thing is coming to an end. There's a war that is raging. You need to make sure that you're calling an election is sure. There's somebody here today, not a baptized member of the church, but you want to say that the Spirit of God spoke to me right now. And I know that I need to give my heart to Jesus. I know that I need to get baptized. I know I need to be ready when Jesus comes. We have somebody here. I want to give your heart to Jesus. Just raise your hand. You want to become a baptized member of God's church? Just raise your hand. I know you're here. And I know you're struggling. God bless you. 
My sister, would you please stand and come on up here to the front. Let's give our heart to you. We serve a power of God. Amen. Is there someone else? Somebody else want to take a stand for Jesus? You want to make sure everything is all right between you and Jesus? We have someone else here. See your little hand. Did you want to come on out? Come on. No? You don't want? Okay. Anyone else? Anyone else want to give their heart to Jesus right now? I want to make sure that you have an opportunity. I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to get right with God. God bless you, my dear. Let's give our heart a minute. We have someone else. Someone else will become a baptized member of God's commandment keeping church. This is not an ordinary church, folks. This is not just another church. This is God's church. This is a remnant church. God has given us the identifying marks of his church. This is going to be the church that's going to undergo persecution. But I want you to know God is going to enable you to be able to stand in these last days. We have somebody else here that want to give your heart to Jesus. You want to give your heart to Jesus? You want to become a member of his, his beautiful royal church? You want to become one of his sons, one of his daughters? Just raise your hand. I don't want to close out. I want to make sure that you have every opportunity to get it right with God. Anyone else? How many want to just be ready when Jesus comes? I want to see your hand. Praise God. Would you stand with me? We need function to be able to function. We need Holy Ghost power falling down upon us. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for this precious family. We want to thank you, Lord, for our dear sister, the little one, Lord, that has made up their mind that they want to unite with you. They want to become baptized members of their church. Father, we just want to give you all the praise and all the glory. Yes. Heavenly Father, we, we just want to thank you for every person standing here. Father, we recognize you as Lord of Lord and King of Kings. And Lord, we're not perfect. We realize that. But Father, we thank you that we're not what we used to because of the changes that are taking place in our life. Heavenly Father, we know that something mysterious is happening in us. Because some of the places that we used to go, we don't even have a desire to go to those places anymore. Some of the things that we used to say, we don't even remember those words anymore. Some of the things that we used to like in terms of diet, we don't even like those things anymore because we know that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We don't want to put anything in our bodies that's going to be found in your temple. So, Father, we just want to give you praise and glory. And, Lord, there are other areas in our life that, Lord, Satan has a stronghold. But, Father, help us to continue to grow in grace because we know that we never let go of your never changing hand, dear God. That you're going to give us victory, you're going to give us power, and one day we're going to wake up and we're going to discover that we don't even have any power in that area anymore. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, may your blessing be upon your people. Father, help us to remain steadfast. Help us to be able to stand. Make us stronger. Make us better wives to our husbands and better husbands to our wives and better children to our parents and better parents to our children and, and better members to each other. Help us, Lord, to move in this army, recognizing authority in this church. Help us, dear God, in the name of Jesus. And if we get off track, Lord, in your own way, in your own merciful way, Father, turn us around so that we will not lose our souls. We give you all the praise and we give you the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the church say, Amen. And amen. Praise the Lord tonight. Matthews and his daughter, they would like Alistair and to be baptized. Yes. Yes.
Let's just say, hey, you got it. How are you? You know, that is so beautiful. Everything we do is about bringing souls to the foot of the cross. Amen. Thank you. 